Take one. This film contains possibly Mark Ruffalo's best owl impression. Who? Who? A pathetic attempt to break some glass. <laughs> and Dave Franco saying businesses. Businesses. I am of course talking about the film. Now you see me. Which is a prequel to Catch Me If You Can, I think. Something like that. I kept getting the names mixed up. <laughs> I watched this film the first time the other day with my girlfriend, and she told me that I wasn't allowed to make fun of it while watching, because she actually enjoys this film. So instead, I'm having to make this video. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, man. The film begins immediately by preparing you for what can only be called a fantasy film. Not because of the insane magic that takes place, but because a street magician has a number one fan that wants to fuck him. I am your biggest fan. Jesse Eisenberg, who is 1.71 meters tall. <laughs> I'm not sure why anyone needs to know the info. He plays our protagonist, J. Daniel Atlas. What the J stands for? One. Anyway, J. Daniel's first trick is gaslighting a woman. He originally says to her, Come in close. The more you think you see, the easier it'll be to fool you. But then he tells her, what have I been telling you all night? The closer you look, the less you see. No, period. Uh, yes, you could probably say that he might have said it before the start of the film. Well, show it in the film then. Or have him say it originally. By the way, while I was searching for a clip of that speech, I found this comment. So, there you go, SpecsTube. Your wish has unfortunately been granted. Subscribe. <laughs> we see a mysterious hooded figure watching Janu perform his panty dropping magic. Also, uh, spoiler for how they did this trick, they had two cards stacked on top of one another. So you can see he flips to one and then the second one is revealed, causing it to show on screen for longer, making you want to pick it. <laughs> trick busted. Uh, oh yeah, and another thing, the girl never actually says what her card was. Janu throws his card into the air and then the building shows the seven of diamonds and the crowd goes mental. Like what, how does the, how does the crowd know that she's uh, chosen that card? She, she could be lying. She's, she's a, what's the word? A plant, she's a plant. So Daniel takes his biggest van home and immediately kicks her out once he sees a card stuffed into his shoe. I tried to lift my foot up. I'm not wearing shoes. Uh, yeah, she, he kicks her out because she means nothing to him. Daniel goes through so many magic groupies. Daniel, Daniel fucks, right? I think we could all agree, Daniel fucks. <laughs> we then meet Merritt, Merritt McKinney, played by Woodrow Woody Harrelson. Har played by Woodrow Woody Harrelson. 1.77 meters, by the way. Merritt is using the power of his uh, gorgeous smile to hypnotize. What the fuck, I can hear myself. Merritt is using the power of his gorgeous smile to hypnotize and openly blackmail people into giving him money in the middle of a fucking rainy restaurant. Who wants to see a street magician while they're eating their food? I'm trying to keep this meal down, bitch. Anyway, he finds a card presumably left by the hooded figure again. I see what you did there. <sighs> Dave Franco is here too. He bends a spoon and gets a card. I'm about to bend this spoon. Henley Reeves is the last member of the group, played by... Isla Fisher. She's about to lock herself in some chains underwater, and if she can't get out in time, she's eaten alive. Eaten alive by bloodthirsty fish! Part of her performance is to act like she can't get out and pretend that she's drowning. Exciting. So, if Miss Fisher, the actress, was actually drowning and couldn't get out, you would think that the director or stunt coordinator would have a signal, safety sign, to realize that she's not acting and is actually in danger of drowning. You would think. Did they do that? I was banging and saying, you know, set me free, but everyone just thought I was doing fabulous acting. They thought I was being Meryl Streep in the tank. Actually, I was drowning. Yeah. No! Very good. <laughs> As she is screaming bubbles for the crowd to help her, one brave man grabs a piece of uh, random metal left behind the stage. The way he swings this piece of metal to attempt to break this glass is... Oh my god, it's so good. Rather than hit it straight on, like that, he swings upwards like that <laughs> he hits this glass and basically ragdolls across the almost into the glass himself <laughs> this scene is so stupid bro. so she, uh she gets eaten uh but not really so she joins the crowd in shouting and screaming and people fall silent as they can pick out her voice from the hundreds of other voices screaming and shouting as if she is she is their baby penguin Astonishingly, in all this racket, a parent and its chick can recognize each other's calls. Oh my God, this is a sick Satan! 
A card is left for Henley too. She notices it fl floating in the fish tank with the piranhas. What a dick move by the hooded figure. Luckily, the sentient fish realize she needs to see the date and time on the back, so they kindly flip it around for her. Thank you, fish. Location change. We're in New York now, by the way. There's this odd transition where we fly through an eye and out of some pigeon's arsehole floating over the city. All right, so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go From this point on, Henley will never not have gloves on for some reason. Character development, I guess. The two meet, uh, what's his name? <coughs> Merritt is already there waiting for them. We get a nice push in on Wood Woody Woodrow's face. <coughs> what the fuck am I saying? Daniel actually introduces himself as J. Daniel Atlas. Uh, J. Daniel Atlas. What a wanker. Um, Dave Franco turns up and kills the vibe. He's Jack, by the way. I'm Jack, by the way. They are stood in the corridor because the door's locked and they can't get in. Nothing's ever locked. He gets the door open for them and they all ask him to leave. Uh, no, not really. I wish. Henley asks, what is this place? What is this place? It's an apartment in an apartment building. Inside, there is a note and rose on the floor. The note reads, now you don't. Which, for the character's perspective, doesn't really make sense because they've no, no one's actually said, now you see me. So this is just totally... A random line for them. Henley places the rose in a vase, vase mm. if you prefer, and CG water begins to flow into a, a sign etched onto the floor. Fog starts to form where the water has met some dry ice. Daniel, concerned by this, draws his flashlight, which I assume he has with him at all times in case he ever ends up in a dingy, poorly lit apartment like this. The most advanced holograms you've ever seen appear in front of them. No one really seems to care. How they can understand any of this mess is beyond me. Just just look at this shit. What the fuck? Daniel, mesmerized, tries to touch the hologram. It's not real, Daniel. It's just light hitting the fog. Title screen. Whoa, yeah, cool. Location change. One year has passed, and the Magic Gang have their own show in Vegas. Ooh, Vegas, baby. They're uh, performing under the name The Four Horsemen. Their logo sucks. What is this? What? What? Four? They tell the audience they are going to rob a bank. Woo, yeehaw. We are going to rob a bank. The crowd love it. Look at this 16 second uninterrupted shot showing how excited the crowd is. Whoa, I definitely needed 16 seconds of this. We get a very half-hearted run and jump from Dave Franco and Merritt. Just look at this. Nice, dude. That's so energetic. I love it. Camera swings around to show your boy Morgan Freeman, aka Thaddeus Bradley, sat with his plus one watching the show. Thaddeus gets spoken to by the show attendant because he's a naughty little boy recording the whole show on his phone. Very naughty, Thaddeus. Alexander, the show attendant. You thought I wouldn't even notice his name, huh, movie? You didn't even give him a name on IMDb. He takes Thaddeus' phone and then bolts out of there so quickly. Okay. See ya! Little did Alexander know. Chadius had backup cameras. Yes, let's go. One for Chadius. These ones are even more obnoxious than his little mobile phone. They literally hold these like guns at one point. <coughs> We're introduced to some Michael Caine's character, Arthur Tressler. He's the big man that's funded this whole show, so he's kind of a big deal to the magicians. So you would expect him to have good seats. Where is he sat? With the schmucks on the plastic seats in the middle of the in the middle of the crowd. Thanks for the money, Art. Etienne. The random audience member that was pulled from the crowd is given instructions about his bank robbery act. The key detail here is that he is French, so his bank is in, you guessed it, Albuquerque, New Mexico. My bank, it's uh, Crédit Républicain de Paris. French, okay. After some song and dance, they reveal the teleportation device. Woo, exciting. He steps inside, slams shut, and he's gone. Wow, magic, it's so amazing. There is uh, a cool detail here that I will come back to and show you in a little bit. Cut to Paris at the same time. We get video footage from Etienne inside the bank. Where is this footage coming from? There's no camera directly in front of his face. He has a microphone here, but no camera. I call shenanigans. This is fake. This magic isn't real. We follow a French woman on her way to work at Credit Republicain Bank. Etienne's bank. Eek. Mad. French bank lady is walking to what we assume is the vault and unlocks some suspiciously CG looking bars. These look CG, right? I'm not going crazy. What the fuck? Bank lady opens the vault and notices all the euro bills are gone. She sounds absolutely devastated. Oh, my Just listen to that passion. Oh, my the money that was being sucked up is then rained down on the audience. Everyone loves it, except Thaddeus and... 
the lady. So the show ends and we move on to our main antagonist, Mr. Mark Ruffalo, AKA Dylan Rose, walking with a Tommy Wiseau lookalike. What the fuck? Oh, hi, Mark. Oh, hey, Johnny, what's up? Back at the FBI office, Rose is talking to a character called Evans, played by Common. Uh, I can't tell you much about this guy, uh, not much on Google. Apart from that, he is informal and British. Hmm. French agent Armadre, played by Melanie Laurent, is sent to assist in this case. Rhodes is ecstatic. You gotta be kidding me. Alma didn't like her hair in a bun anymore, so it's now in a ponytail. Rhodes accidentally uses a trigger word that sets Etienne off into hi a hypnotic trance. That was hard to say. Trigger word that sets Etienne off into her... That's <laughs> Etienne off into her... That's um, Etienne off into her... A, do a hypnotic trance, my god. Rhodes accidentally uses a trigger word that sets Etienne off into a hypnotic trance. Finally. Bullshit. Rhodes reveals he is racist against French people. Too many French people in one room. Dave Frankaroo is here too, but they make the correct decision and choose to ignore him. Henley is fucking around with a chair or something. I don't know. Merritt's just having fun. Just having fun. Rhodes and Alma sit down with Janiel. And Rhodes is a bit confused about Janiel's current situation. Rhodes says Janiel is acting like he wants to get arrested. You are literally begging to be arrested, you know that? Uh, is he not already arrested? He, you literally have him in handcuffs tied to the table, dude. He didn't come here voluntarily. Rhodes gives a speech about maintaining his resolve. I can maintain my resolve. Janiel wants Rhodes to come close and get all over him. Come close, Rhodes. Come all over me, Rhodes. <laughs> Come close. Get get all over me. 30 seconds after saying he can maintain his resolve, Rhodes fails to maintain his resolve. I'm gonna nail you. With no actual evidence, the gang are all let go, including Dave Franco, unfortunately. The FBI find out that Thaddeus Bradley, aka Morgan Freeman, was recording the whole show, so they agreed to have some lunch with him and have a little chin wag. They have a little powwow about a dead guy in a safe. Lionel Shrike. Shrike. This clip of Rhodes gets used twice in this whole scene. Thanks for spotting that, Editor Robbie. He informs him about their next show, and Rhodes is like, How the fuck do you know where their next show is gonna be? And Thaddeus is like, Bro, they gave it a flyer for the next show. You dumb. They get onto the topic about how they did the bank robbery, and because Thaddeus is good at debunking magic, he can somehow decipher how they did the actual bank robbery? Okay. They make their way back to the theater where the show took place. Thaddeus demonstrates how the bank robbery trick was done by having Rhodes step into the teleportation device. They run through the setup and the device time shut again. But this time we see Rhodes falling from the ceiling into the basement. The bank vault. Wow. The point I mentioned earlier that had a cool detail is during the actual show, if we go through frame by frame, there is a tiny frame one frame where we see Etienne is halfway through falling down. Um, you would never ever notice that during the actual first time you're watching it. And I thought it was a pretty cool detail that they actually included it. Rhodes is not amused. Hardy, har, har. They get onto the topic of the French guy Etienne and why they chose him. They talk about palming the ball they needed for his seat. But just look at this little robot arm that comes out of uh, Merritt's sleeve. It looks like a little alien tongue trying to help him out. <laughs> Just having fun. Thaddeus talks about how they programmed Etienne's mind into making him want to go to Vegas. But as he is explaining, he's talking over the programming that Merritt is doing, so you can't really hear what he's saying. Um, kind of like what I'm doing right now. Henley grabs Etienne's head and says, I got his measurements. As if this is a huge component for the, the trick. If you need the helmet to be snug, why not just have an adjustable one? Why do you need his exact measurements? Also, once again, Dave Franco is missing from this scene. His character is so useless, they don't know what to do with him. It's, it's getting embarrassing. The, the writers don't know what to do with his character. Thaddeus explains that they got Etienne's signature through his credit card, which doesn't make a lot of sense either because he could have bought the tickets online. What they could have done was have Dave, in that earlier programming scene, they could have had Dave Franco pickpocket, because we've seen that he's good at pickpocketing, pickpocket his wallet, check the signature, make a note of it, put the wallet back. That would have been an interesting scene. That You know, that you could have made use of his character then. Thaddeus then moves on to how the actual bank robbery took place after being a pedantic little shit. No, I didn't say they didn't steal the money. I said they didn't rob the bank. We see the money in France being moved on a metal pallet, which we can clearly see through. They move the money into a truck. 
They lock the doors. The camera moves through, down through the money to reveal two faces hiding inside the pallet. What? There is no way they would fit between that pallet. Plus, we already saw it was empty earlier. Anyway, they drug a guard and steal the money. They replace it with some fake money, which they don't really explain. It is in these three short little clips that we see money being moved into the truck. Another thing, the boot of the car was already open in this shot, but then in the next shot, we see it opening again. Rhodes asks how the fake money in the bank vault disappeared, and luckily, Thaddeus, ex-magician, has some magic up his sleeve. Flash paper. He doesn't explain how the flash paper ignited in the bank vault, though. There was nothing there to set it off. Or how when they dropped off the money, there's a fucking knocked out guard in the truck. That, does that not raise any suspicions? Another detail they forgot to show was them placing the signed card with Etienne's signature, which they had faked, into the middle of the pile of money. They could have at least shown Daniel placing this evidence into the truck. Moving on, funny man Conan makes an appearance featuring Skype. Rose and Alma are on a flight. Rhodes is acting like some kid is kicking that ever-living shit out of his seat, but the dude behind him is like reading and he's not doing anything. What, what are you doing, Rhodes? On a separate flight, the horse gang are en route to their next show. Merritt probably comes up with the funniest joke during this whole film. Let me mull over that offer of cheap and meaningless sex. Cheap and, and meaningless, maybe, but uh, not time-consuming. <laughs> Rhodes shows the bare minimum of teeth and Alma seems to think he is smiling. <laughs> That's my on your face. That's my on your face. Is it real? Is it real? That's no smile, honey. That's a grimace. <laughs> Daniel hears Henley having too much fun with Merritt, so he goes over to spoil the fun. As he's walking past, Dave Franco's character wants to speak to him about his role in the show real quick. Can I talk to you about my role in the show yeah, real yeah, quick? Yeah, sure. Even the other characters in this film realize how boring and useless Dave Franco's character is. Art wants someone to do him. Do me. What he is referring to is the mentalism trick that Merritt is known for. But this time, Daniel is giving it a go. Blah, blah, blah. He's not very good at this. He gets two wrong answers. Snuffles Snapple. and Cushman, Cushman Armitage. Armitage. I'm sure these answers are meaningless. In New Orleans now, and the FBI have overtaken some random woman's house to use as a base of operations. They also come up with some rubbish about how Daniel always has his crew wearing tracking bracelets. Remember how Alice is such a control freak? He's got his whole crew on those tracking bracelets. What? Since when? We have not seen it once throughout this whole film. Even Rhodes is confused. What tracking bracelets? This is just some lame bullshit to give some excitement later on. Those bracelets are on a right, sub-8 flat band. Oh. Alma and Rhodes begin to think there might be a fifth horseman. <laughs> Nay! Faddis is in the middle of filming one of his TV episodes when he's interrupted by an old man clapping as fast as he can. Arthur is trying to bribe Thaddeus into stop debunking the horseman with a check for $3.5 million. Thaddeus declines, so now Arthur is going to be blunt. Let me be blunt. He gets butt hurt and then starts talking about how much more money he has than him. My is much, much bigger than yours. Art then goes on about how if he doesn't stop, he'll make his life very difficult using lawyers. <gasps> and my lawyers. I just don't find Michael Caine very intimidating throughout this whole scene. Or the whole film, to be honest. He just doesn't come across as menacing or powerful he comes across as someone pretending to be powerful does that make sense first time you've been threatened by me oh shit later that evening the show begins dave franco is looking for some pencils they make a bunny disappear but not really <laughs> what the f is going on here moving on from the bubble blowing bonanza Merritt is explaining the setup for the next trick to us it involves the audience writing down their current bank balance on a piece of paper he then tells them whatever they wrote is wrong Everyone is apparently an idiot. You're all wrong. They bring big man Art down again. At least he had a decent seat this time. They reveal that Art also has a big envelope with his bank balance on it too. But what's this? Art's is wrong too. Merritt then tells everyone to take out one of Daniel's many spare flashlights and heat up the piece of paper that they had written their balance on. But the way the audience heats up their piece of paper is so idiotic. Rather than have the torch directly against the piece of paper where the most heat would be, they hold it a good few inches away and just shine on it as if they would ever heat it up. Dave Franco brings out a big studio light to heat up Art's piece of paper. The figures magically start to change. Art's figure is now down $70,000. A lady in the audience stands up as the figure she wrote has increased by $70,000. Wow! Another woman gained some money, way more than the first. I would be pissed if I was that first lady. She got $210,000 more than me, what the fuck? The gang is giving a heartfelt explanation about people losing their homes. Their cars, their jobs, their loved ones, their businesses. Yeah, thanks, Dave Franco. It turns out Arthur Tressler's insurance company owes these people all of this money but hasn't paid out. Random audience member number three gains the attention of the whole theatre with just a few woes. It's for sure. 
He explains that he just gained $82,000 into his bank account. He knows this because he just checked the banking app on his cell phone. It says it right here on my cell phone! Thanks for clarifying, regular human. Everyone then checks their phones to see their bank balance. This woman pulls up her phone and it's literally a screenshot that has to rotate. You, you can even see the share button right here. <laughs> Art is pissed. He wants to know if the horsemen are responsible for this. Did you do this? They nonchalantly explain that they would have needed Art's passwords to be able to do that. Failing that, they would have needed his um, security questions, possibly his old pet's name Snapple. or Snapple. his mother's maiden Armitage. name. Excuse me. Armitage. Jan, you sexy genius. I'm beginning to see what Trixie Mattel sees in him. I could be Jesse's girl. Anyway, they go to leave the stage, but oh no, scary art is going to attack. Oh. Oops, never mind. Art is somehow chained to the floor. When did this happen? I don't know. I literally went through, I went back and looked through the whole show again to see if anyone went, even went near his feet. And nope, nope, apparently he j it just happened. The magic again, I guess. Rhodes has seen enough. I've seen enough, he says. No, he, not really. Please! I guess Rhodes is probably just mad he didn't get some money. I guess he's just green with envy. Yeah, keep getting away with it. Lots of running. Ooh, wee, excitement. Rhodes is handed a tracker for one of the many bracelets that Janu and his crew always wear, apparently. As he's following the tracker, he jumps on top of some parked cars and accidentally sets off the car alarms. But looking at it, the lights are not even flashing on any of these cars. The lights on this car are already on before he's even jumped on it. How are any of these cars even meant to get out when they're boxed in like this, anyway? Rhodes is such a prick. He's moving through the crowd and he just shoves these people to the left and he's going right anyway. They're not even in his way. Some more chasing disguised Franco slips a bracelet into Rhodes' jacket pocket. Why is he dressed like a stripper cop though? Why not just dress as like someone with loads of beads around their neck because that's what everyone looks like. Instead, you're standing out looking like a stripper running through the street. Even without a tracker, Alma is doing a better job than Rhodes. She even catches up to Daniel. She catches up to him. Holds him at gunpoint, but unfortunately, Daniel, the wily minx, just gives another little cheeky wave and drops down behind her at a wall. <laughs> Rose is absolutely furious that Alma is not an American police officer and didn't just shoot unarmed Daniel. What are you doing? Arthur seems to think that Thaddeus has a part to play in this magic act with the four horsemen. He goes to say something, but then is interrupted by Thaddeus. Being bad. You know. I can destroy you, yes. Thaddeus finished his sentence like he knew what he was going to say. But Art has never said, I can destroy you to Thaddeus. It would have made sense for him to finish his sentence if we had heard Arthur use that phrase in the earlier scene with them, but he didn't. So how does he know what he's going to say? There's been this whole mystery group that keeps getting mentioned throughout this film. The Eye. The Eye. The Eye. The Eye. The eye. Basically, Alma thinks that the horsemen are in the middle of trying to join this exclusive club. Back in New York and the gang are in panic mode. They are freaking out and destroying evidence. Dave Franco is told to stay behind and burn evidence as he is useless and expendable. Dave Franco agrees. Stay here and burn it all. The Fuzz are swarming their hideout. Janu can see them through the sheets of newspaper are covering their windows. They're here. I think he is uh, reading their movements between the lines. Stinks. Dave Franco is left alone to burn evidence in the apartment, but he's doing it in like one sheet of paper at a time. Are you not in a rush, dude? And why is there a need for paper anyway? They they were using the holograms at the start of this film. Why, why not keep using that? Why is, it, why is the need for all this shitty paper everywhere? So the FBI start raiding the building, and it turns out Dave Franco's magic is hiding the fact that he's been a ninja this entire film. <laughs> This random spoon-bending street magician is able to take on two federal agents like it's nothing. Where was the build-up to this? Were, were there any subtle hints that he could manage something like this? All they showed was him bending, bending some spoons, spoons, picking some pockets, shining some lights, and saying businesses. Oh, and the uh, running high five. I guess that... Is that athletic enough to count as being a ninja? Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne. I'm Jack, by the way. It is so out of character, this whole scene. If this was the plan of the writers the whole time, to make you think this ca this character is absolutely useless, just to surprise you with the shock that he's, wow, this guy is amazing, actually. What the hell? That is just really poor writing and just really forced and unlikable. It's just really off-putting. Uh, so anyway, he continues to fight Rhodes, throws some fire, using magic, I guess. And then he does this bizarre move where he throws a fire poker up in the air, and then... What? 
And what happens? It, nothing happens. This is the most redundant move I've ever seen in a fight. Rhodes gets confused by a mirror like a dog seeing his reflection for the first time. Road smash! Dave Franco escapes the building by sliding down a trash chute where he belongs. He then steals a car to begin the mediocre car chase scene. The best part of this whole scene is Dave Franco cheering and then immediately exploding. <laughs> The FBI have discerned what the horseman's next target is going to be. A big ass safe in the middle of a random warehouse left on its own. But oh no, Rhodes keeps f***ing up so a new FBI agent has come in to take over the case. Abracadabra, I'm taking over. Great, another magician to deal with. They turn up to where the safe is being held. But what's this? The safe is gone. It turns out Evans, this guy, has ordered the safe to be moved. Evans denies this, but it turns out he just can't remember doing it as he was hypnotized at the time. Anyway, they, they stopped the truck that was transporting the safe. And just for context, they mentioned that this safe contains half a billion dollars. Or at least that was what Alma mentioned earlier. They've been hiding close to a half billion dollars. And that is how to make a great approach. $100 is the largest sum of US paper currency. A single $100 bill weighs one gram. So $500 million in $100 bills would be 5 million notes. At one gram a note, that would be 5 million grams or 5,000 kilos or five tons. I'm just saying you would need an impressive forklift to lift that load. And as someone who's forklift certified, I'm impressed. They followed the safe to this new location where it was being sent to, a club called Five Points with a Z. Very cool. The Five Points, very cool, building has these insane visuals being projected onto the side of the building, but they don't work like actual 2D projections on a wall. You can see a parallax from the camera move revealing more of the room. That's, um, that's not how that would work. Daniel, Merritt and Henley have a sweet heart to heart in this slowest elevator ride on earth. And just so you know, I did try and spot if there were any continuity errors with the graffiti to see if it went past the same part twice. I'm afraid to say I didn't spot any. Curse you, accurate continuity! Meanwhile, Rhodes catches up to the actual gang and fully attempts to murder them. All the people around Rhodes don't seem to care that he's just shot a fucking gun in this crowded rooftop and tried to murder someone. Alma, she though, she cannot resist his murderous urges. Oh, attempted murder. That's that's their meet cue, attempted murder. <laughs> so it turns out the money floating down was actually fake. And the real money was left in Faddis' car to set him up and get him behind bars, that wanker. Pause! Pause! Uh, where was I? So Faddis gets arrested and says he's been framed. I've been framed. He says these bars give a man time to think. Uh, these bars give a man time to think. Which is a little strange as it sounds like something someone would say if they had been locked away from civilization for the better part of 40 years after they had murdered their wife by disabling brakes on her car, which accidentally killed a neighbor and their child, but they had learned the error of their way since being locked up. You, you've been in here for like an hour, dude. Dave Franco comes back from the dead. God fucking damn. He was never dead. Whoa, surprise. Faddis explains how Dave Franco survived this elaborate plan involving a second car. But if we go back and look at the original clip of the crash, there is no car attached to the front of the bus. Even when the car is crashing, where is Dave Franco's car to be seen in the in front of the other one? But now, for the big reveal. The person who originally gave our street magicians the cards, that gave them the plans with the holograms in the walls, who was assisting them the entire film from the shadows. Dylan Rhodes. Dylan Rhodes. Thaddeus is not happy and asks, why? Why? Okay, so that's basically the end of the film. Rhodes meets up with the horsemen and they have fun on the merry-go-round and now are officially part of the elusive club, The Eye. Some other boring shit with Alma and Rhodes. It is revealed that Rhodes is Lionel Shrike's son. No one cares. The end. Okay, so did I enjoy this film? Mostly... No. <laughs> on my first viewing, no, I hated it. But I have watched it a few times now since trying to make this video. There are some plot points I didn't like, or that didn't make sense. Okay, point number one that I didn't like. Rhodes locking Thaddeus away. I couldn't figure out why on my first viewing. I thought it was because he was debunking magic and Rhodes didn't like that, I thought. Is that a good enough reason to lock someone away? I thought, what an absolute wanker Rhodes is. But it's only after I started editing this, this video that I realized there's one conversation where Thaddeus reveals why Rhodes may not like him very much. So as far as I can tell, Rhodes blames Thaddeus for his father's death. Why? 
Oh, excuse me. Lionel Shrike, I revealed all of his tricks. Faddis explains that he used to expose all of Lionel's tricks, making him lose credibility and become a nobody, essentially. So Lionel, desperate to make a comeback, locks himself in a safe and is attempting to escape the safe underwater being dumped into the river. He died, so Rhodes blames Thaddeus. I had completely forgotten that conversation even took place because it's it's such a, like a passing thing and it's so boring just having a conversation in a in a restaurant. While Thaddeus is locked up, Rhodes could have said something like, that's from my father. And then I would have been like, oh, wow, okay. But nothing like that happens. Basically, we're just left as confused as Thaddeus at the end of the film going, why? Why is he locked away? And secondly, Dave Franco's character. My God, he, he is so redundant in this film is just useless they have no idea what to do with him and i just thought it's such a waste because he's he's a i don't have anything against dave frank i just thought it was a funny bit he is just useless in this film his character does nothing except drive some cars and then die and then come back and break some break a mirror that's it he's fucking worthless anyway overall i thought catch me if you can was a bit goofy a bit cheesy but it was fun am i loud enough and I would recommend watching it if you like a bit of fun. What's it called? Now you see me. F